All right, I am Robin Axel Adams. I'm the manager of the Fairbank Center for Medical Ethics. Um, and we're so glad that you are joining us today. Um, and thank you for your continued flexibility as we continue to navigate the best format for our lecture. Um, we were going to be live until Monday and there is great flexibility in the midst of all that's going on here. Um, and so we'll see where we're going to be next month. And, and we will let everyone know as we know. A note about our next two lectures, um, as the labor and delivery moves over to Riley this month, we are taking the October and the November lectures to look about the ethical issues related to that change of practice of having adult women to be cared for in a children's hospital. So we hope that you'll join us for October and November. Before we begin today's lecture, I want to introduce um, our newest group of ethics fellows. Our Fairbanks Fellowship in Clinical Ethics began last week. They are all gathered down in our conference room and this year we're so excited that we have nine amazing fellows. And so I just wanna share with you and announce who our fellows are. So we have Carmen Davis, who is a clinical nurse specialist at IU Health University Hospital. We have Michael um, Ivanchek, who is a chaplain fellow with IU Health. We have Matt Fields, who's a PhD student and, at IUPUI School of Nursing. Jen Funk, who's a director of nursing at Community Heart and Vascular Hospital. Um, Kirsten Guadero, who's an assistant professor of humanities and theology at Indiana University. Cindy Hunter, who's a genetic counselor in the Department of Medical and um, Molecular Genetics. Jessica Journey, who is our uh, director of donor experience at IU Health Foundation. Andrew um, Koivanomi, Quino, who's a neurology resident at IU Health. And Kelsey Miller, who is our project manager at the Department of Clinical and Organizational Ethics. So we're so excited to have um, these amazing people join us for this year's fellowship class. A few more preliminaries. Um, while we have all feel like we've mastered Zoom, um, my challenge of getting in this morning shows me that I am still not mastering Zoom. And so we appreciate all of your understanding of any technical issues that may develop during this webinar. We are recording the webinar and it will be available to our website, fairbankcenter.org within the next week. And the recordings are eligible for a continuing ed for 30 days and continuing medical education for the next year. So we encourage you to send your colleagues this information. And you will receive a link for the evals for the CME and the CE tomorrow at the email address that you registered for. So we can encourage you to, to um, fill out your evaluations even if you don't need credit, because this helps us track our attendance and it allows you to provide feedback and comments on the lecture. I wanna let you know that the Q&A box is available to post questions. However, we will not be responding to most questions until the end of the presentation when Dr. Weber is available. And Dr. Weber has no relevant financial conflicts of interest to disclose. All right, with all of that, let me introduce Dr. Emily Weber to you. MD, F-A-A-P, F-A-M-I-A, -A -A, lots of great initials. She is the Chief Medical Information Officer for Indiana University Health and Riley Children's Health. She is a practicing physician. She's board certified in pediatrics, pediatric hospital medicine, and clinical informatics. Dr. Weber is an affiliate scientist at the Regan Street Institute and currently the chairperson for the American Academy for Pediatric Council on Clinical Information Technology. Having worked on many IT implementations, her work is now focused on optimizing the health of I, uh, the optimization of health IT, applications to improve quality care and patient safety, and innovation and patient di digital experience. And just a sort of as a side personal note, when I invited um, when we reached out to Dr. Weber to ask her to speak, I think I said something like. I know there is some cutting edge stuff going on with AI and the electronic medical record, but I don't even know enough to know what to ask you to speak about. Can you do something? And I think I might have been that technical. Um, and she enthusiastically said yes. And so I'm um, having spent a couple of times meeting with her. I think she says enthusiastically yes to everything, um, but I am grateful that she can take my not very technical language and know what I was trying to ask of her and for her to be able to come and teach us today. So Dr. Weber, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I, what, a, what a lovely introduction. I, I wish I could, uh, I'll carry that with me through the rest of the day as well. So, um, and thank you again, everyone for your flexibility and, and um, accommodating. As, as was mentioned, I'm a pediatrician and then we are definitely seeing uh, children impacted in this most recent wave. So I'm glad to be with you safely. And I hope that some of you will um, reach out in the, in the questions and also um, in the uh, 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 afterwards as well. So um, I am going to get to speak with all of you about ethical challenges in artificial intelligence and other technologies. And um, as was mentioned, um, I, I am rather excited about this topic because um, we're seeing so much and so much promise 
But given this audience and your area of expertise, a lot of what I'm talking about today is about asking good questions. And sometimes the good questions are hard questions. So knowing this group and um, welcome to the new fellows, um, knowing so many of you um, are part of my clinical team, I'm, I'm just really reassured that we're willing to tackle this with this lens. As was mentioned, I have no financial disclosures. I will disclose though that I um, get to work as a pediatrician at Riley Children's Health, which most of you are familiar with. And um, I am unabashedly pro-child health and also um, love my, my clinical work. Um, I think that, that a lot of us in clinical health care have felt that in the last year. And um, Riley Children's Health has a lot, of, um, a lot of numbers here on my kind of uh, orientation slide. But um, for those of you less familiar, we are a quaternary care children's hospital in Indianapolis, as well as our primary care and specialty care clinics. We have an incredibly high amount of um, children's hospital research dollars um, that contribute to our mission in that area. And then I also get to teach medical students and residents in my clinical work. Um, IU Health is also a, a consideration I serve in that capacity as well. We are the largest provider across the state of Indiana with hospitals, um, ERs, ORs, um, and clinics that are very widespread. And then not to mention, we have about 34,000 team members total supporting that mission. So just to orient you about what I'm about to speak to, that's, that's where I live clinically. And um, the goals today are pretty straightforward. We're going to talk about key attributes um, to help you identify key attributes of AI in healthcare technologies and what you think about with those. We're going to talk about some uh, challenges um, in the form of case use cases. And then I'm hoping um, to bring uh, and solicit your in input and thoughts about how the lens of medical ethics can be applied here. Um, I suppose I should say in full disclosure, I feel it's desperately needed. So I'm looking forward to, to sharing this with you. So as we kind of go forward, understanding what AI is and specifically what machine learning is will be really helpful. Um, and artificial intelligence has been defined since the early 1940s, 1950s um, as computer science developed. But um, a good way to think about it kind of uh, to say, is this AI or not, is thinking about um, whether the actual software can learn, adapt, and predict. And particularly in machine learning, I use that as a good example, that's under the umbrella of a type of artificial intelligence. Um, this is machine learning is when you give a set of rules or behaviors, and then the AI actually uses the data to learn patterns. So also under artificial intelligence is robotics, natural language processing, et cetera. And the way that AI learns those patterns can be simple pattern recognition. It can be supervised or unsupervised all the way to something where it's enforcing itself. And the main reason to understand this for what we're talking about today, um, there is, a, of course, a, <coughs> excuse me, a range of, um, of these technologies. And what has happened kind of in the last, the last several years is that there's some marketing and bundling around that. So I actually think it's, it's really important for all of us to understand what that is. Um, AI in healthcare has actually been around for a long time. We use these tools around pattern recognition and we use it in our everyday life. But um, another way to kind of think about this is that when a computer is really performing simple tasks over and over again, and when you tell the program, the programmer is able to tell the computer all the steps, that's, that's really kind of logic rules. Where AI starts to challenge that is that because of how quickly and how broadly a computer can execute those rules, it can start to see uh, the computer itself sees trends and patterns that don't correlate with, with what a human can understand. And that's where the supervision part of things um, gets, gets beyond us. So, um, whoops, go back here. So one good way to think about this is from a man named John McCarthy, he's a Stanford scientist, and he, um, <coughs> was an early, adopt, an early adopter and researcher on AI. But in 2004, he has this very um, classic sort of statement that um, what AI is. And it says, AI does not confine itself to methods which are uh, biologically observable. And so as we move through our case studies, I think thinking about that, is this something I can observe and understand or is it not? That helps distinguish what is AI and what is, what is not. So good questions. Um, this is a, a construct that I use, honestly, quite frequently. 
Um, because what will happen in my, in my life and probably in your clinical life too, is that something comes forward to help you solve a problem and it's AI. It's going to, it's going to do things more quickly and, and to help you meet this great need. So when I'm presented with that, one of the things I lean into um, from kind of a, that lens is asking about the range of intelligence. Does the tool detect patterns? Does it observe outcomes? So is it kind of a full loop? Um, did a human write all the rules that this program knows? Um, which sounds kind of funny when you think about it, but when you get further into AI, sometimes those tools are writing rules that itself, it's not what the human wrote. Um, does the algorithm or the software adjust on its own? Or is it adjusting based on a rule I gave it? And then this is kind of maybe the most technical question. Does the feature of an AI tool, is it set in a way that a human observer could actually understand and compare? And I'll, I'll give you some examples of what that means. Um, and then um, there's always uh, beware the buzzwords. So um, the buzzwords, a lot of things in, are in healthcare now are marketed as a smart technology or internet of things or cloud technology. And those are all real things. But as you start to peel the layer, having trusted allies um, in your IIS and technology team can help you distinguish what is real AI and machine learning versus what is maybe repackaged. So if you take those ideas, hopefully your wheels are starting to churn a little bit about like, hmm, this sounds maybe something a little bit out of the realm of, of maybe traditional um, healthcare. I think you would be right. Um, I really like these trends as kind of were, were put forth in this, um, this kind of uh, overview that was from the AMA Journal of Ethics because it kind of calls out some of these considerations. Um, I'll, I'll point to patient autonomy um, uh, as well as informed consent as kind of those big, um, big uh, tent poles of what we need to be considering. But in the same breath, we have to think about confidentiality, data security, and cult, uh, cultural competency of these tools. Um, if you are training an algorithm or software product on a data set, for example, does that data set include everyone you're intending to, to use the tool for? These are constant questions that I think those of us that work in these technologies want to be asking. Um, I will tell you, it does make me, you're kind of the party pooper sometimes when you show up and you start asking these questions because there's a lot of pressure to do things um, quickly, right? So um, if you think about the and I will, I will, uh, I'm not an ethicist. I should have said that at the beginning of my disclosures. Um, but when, when I, I am like all physicians trained in the idea of those four main ethical principles, beneficence, non-maleficence, autonomy, justice. When you look at this slide, to me, I think it actually complements just beautifully. And you, you can use those constructs for these technologies just the way you could for other treatments. Um, I can make that argument. And I'm going to show you some of those in the case, use case. Um, there are some, um, there's some key trends emerging here. And I just, I put this in here. Um, it is from an extract from the Harvest Harvard Business Review, because um, I think this is a consideration. There's a lot of potential um, financial pressure for these tools as well. And you can see some of these called out here, like a robot assisted surgery, um, which sounds, it's always the ones that are on the news. Those are kind of some very high tech, very, um, visible ways that a machine may be able to be more precise um, than, than maybe we've ever been before. But some of these feel very approachable. Like if I said I had a tool to help reduce um, dosage errors, or I had a way to help expedite clinical trial enrollment, these are all uh, noble causes that we have great need in healthcare. But again, um, <laughs> hopefully laying that foundation of, of asking the good questions of each of these tools. A really important one in machine learning is bias. Um, I mentioned the data sets that we use to train these algorithms. And the same things that you think about with bias in an individual, um, which a lot of us are more familiar now, so all, all of us have unconscious or implicit bias, um, can exist in a data set as well. Um, and I'm, this is not to, it's beyond the scope of both my knowledge and this lecture to give you a full review of all of the bias within um, uh, data sets. That actually predates a lot of these technologies, but they can be amplified in those technologies. A good example of a bias in a data set would be um, a sampling error. But there's actually a couple other ways to think about risk points for bias. You could um, think about it in um, 
uh, in the recruitment, like we just said, and here's, here's a nice illustration of that. If you have the whole population and you only sample ones that are red and yellow dots, then you will have a bias going in to train your algorithm that you're mostly dealing with red and yellow dots and your blue and purple dots won't have the same considerations. But even after you take that data set, you could misapply the resulting output. Um, you might not be measuring the efficacy. Um, there's a little bit of uh, convenience sampling sometimes with technologies, like maybe you set out to do A, but it ends up seeming to produce a result in B, just like any research. And then I think this is one that is, uh, is, is true as well. We may not call out the bias in, our, in AI tools. Um, because it's technology, because it feels like data should be trustworthy and the computer is going to apply those rules really consistently, it feels like perhaps um, a, an algorithm or a software would be less biased. It could be, but unless we ask those questions and compare and do the research, we won't really know. Um, there is also, uh, this is another way to think about um, uh, at, uh, medical AI tools. This is from a paper just um, for March of this year from the Journal of American Medical Informatics Association. And you can see it's kind of color-coded all the different ways that you could uh, lose trust in applying an AI tool. We talked about gathering bias data, but there's also automation bias. We always, uh, it sounds always like such a great idea. We may be more inclined to automate things um, because of different efficiency pressures. Um, this is a very nice uh, reference to kind of check yourself about um, the application of medical AI. But then there's another way to think about it. I've mentioned the pressures we're all under. We're all virtual today for some a very real pressure of our COVID pandemic. But there's a lot of other pressure, <coughs> excuse me, um, to be trying new things um, in healthcare in particular so that we can reach more patients and, and serve them. So uh, there is a, a tool used in the technology community here called the Gartner Hype Cycle. And um, they, they publish this every year. And we can see in the first part, this is the innovation trigger. This is like when everything, you can't turn around without hearing about these kinds of technologies. Um, usually these technologies rise to the, what is called the peak of inflated expectations. And it just seems like they're gonna solve every problem you could come up with. Um, then you move into the trough of disillusionment, <laughs> the slope of enlightenment, and then finally the plateau of productivity. And um, it's a, it's a, uh, you know, an engaging way to think about technology because uh, like a lot of things, um, they will seem like the hot new thing, but very few of them actually make this to, them to this plateau of productivity to actually help us um, help our patients and deliver more healthcare. So it depends when you catch something about the relative um, likelihood that it's going to be something you continue to use. And that's why I think today's conversation and, and all of your expertise as, as people, um, Learning about training in and, and applying uh, medical ethics is going to be so important to this. Um, a more uh, fun way to think about this might be like, why can't we just use AI to manage everything for us? And then you have Alexa pipe in and say, I found a place that sells you funnel cakes. Um, it just seems incredibly pervasive in other industries. And so there's a lot of thought about why can't we just solve this in healthcare? And then um, just briefly, um, I think a consideration on whether it's appropriate and, and right to kind of look at these technologies is the public perception. And with any individual person, um, there's a number of components that they think about with regards to how they would manage it and live with AI in their lives. Um, what is the convenience factor, the privacy factor? What's their individual choice? And then their sense of individuality as well. So what's interesting is that if you think of all the things in our life every day that are predicated on these AI technologies um, and how many we readily accept and embrace even and have become almost maybe too reliant on um, your Amazon deliveries, the way your bank will text you that something is due or over, overdone. Um, I am sitting here watching my watch buzz at me that I have not been active enough today in those fitness trackers, the voice recognition. And then I included here, the way people want and need sort of their, their uh, maybe a COVID test result or a vaccination in this current pandemic is maybe something that's moved into that. I do accept this and want this in my everyday life. What's fascinating is if you go and look at the literature, a lot of people don't want this for their healthcare. Um, I have two studies here um, that are one from uh, the UK and um, one from uh, um, a population in the United States 
the UK one said that only, um, or actually two thirds, 63% of their survey were uncomfortable with letting personal data be used to improve healthcare. Um, I, didn't, I did not include the survey questions here, but it is interesting to think about how that survey asked this, because if you ask them, would you be okay sharing your personal data to get your medicines delivered to you or to get um, find the nearest location to get your COVID swab? Would that change things? And then um, the one from uh, the Journal of Consumer Research said that patients were less likely to utilize services if it was provided by AI and they wanted to pay less for it. So as a patient, I might be very different than as a, a kind of just an everyday citizen. As a patient of, of healthcare, I might be less willing to engage with these tools. So there's kind of some built-in reluctance from our, our patients in some venues. So having sort of set that background, I'd love to kind of move into some examples uh, pulled from the headlines, as they say. These are real examples of technologies um, and uh, that we've either been, either I've been personally asked to evaluate for use or um, have been deployed and studied at other institutions. And um, as we move through these four samples, I'm just going to, I will mark things with a red flag <laughs> if, um, um, cause that is kind of what we have done in terms of the evaluation of these tools. So the first one is pediatric sepsis. This one is obviously, if you are a pediatrician, this is something that you study and learn to recognize and treat um, very, very early on. And we have a tool um, for clinical decision support, which is pediatric sepsis. And it would qualify as machine learning, but it qualifies pretty far on the side of us telling the tool um, the rules we want it to follow. Now, it does is a well-validated positive outcome. If you can detect sepsis earlier and intervene, you'll have better outcomes. So that's a, a, a kind of a positive thing in this tool's favor. Um, this particular tool that we use at IU Health and at Riley is part of a large objective data set um, that has been validated um, through collaboration from several children's hospitals. Um, now, is that data fully representative and inclusive of of all the children that are at risk for getting sepsis. And we would only know that if we really went in and looked at the data set. Um, since it's coming from children's hospitals, is there a selection bias um, from children more represented in those larger cities, for example? And are we underrepresenting um, children that are uh, coming from other locations? Um, so as we, think to, we thought about using this tool, these are the questions we went through. Um, and we gave ourselves a little red flag about is this data set validated? Is, is it right for the children of Indiana that we're going to be using this for? Um, there are multiple tools to utilize. Uh, if you do a PubMed search for pediatric sepsis AI tools, you will see many major children's hospitals publishing their outcomes of the tools they developed. And you do need a data scientist or um, someone strongly understanding of those algorithms about how much was programmed and how much was learned by the tool. So if you take ped sepsis and you walk through our, our questions, um, it kind of, it does check some boxes that help us feel fairly reassured. Does it de detect patterns and observe outcomes? Yes, it does. Did a, did a human um, write the logic rules or would a human recognize what the model is? And the answer is yes. Um, it is not adjusting on its own. Um, it is embedded within our electronic health record and we oversee it. So, so in terms of confidence of this tool, we feel fair, and, and there's no mention of it involving um, the internet of things. It doesn't have any of our <laughs> worrisome buzzwords. So when you use these kinds of questions, this particular pediatric sepsis tool feels, it, it's, it's familiar to us, right? It's, it's kind of a falling into that category. It's not raising a lot of red flags, <clears throat> excuse me. But it does provoke the questions of, um, that we are including here. So how will we compare using the tool before and after? Are we more accurate with this tool than we were before? Um, this did come up as we were discussing it. Should we be separately consenting our patients if we're using these tools? Do we have to consent differently? Um, what can we call out the risks and benefits of this tool versus not using this tool? And then should patients be allowed to opt out of this tool? In this case, um, the uh, intervention was earlier, or the desired behavior was an earlier intervention for sepsis. And so we, we addressed these questions by running the tool silently um, and then correlating it um, with the outcomes data. And then also, we do not have a separate consent for this though. Um, we include it as kind of part of the work. So 
that is the first example. Hopefully that's getting your wheels churning about the type of assessment we would do. Um, the next use case I have is in behavioral health. And um, I actually, there's been a couple of different um, applications brought forward, but I actually pulled out a few that um, from other organizations and I'll summarize them here. Um, the first is a tool that will actually analyze and describe therapy sessions. So it will record the session and then it will apply its proprietary um, uh, natural language processing, tool, which is a type of machine learning um, to that session to analyze um, its attributes. So the question that raises eth the ethical question in terms of patient autonomy, and um, honestly, probably are we first do no harm and uh, that kind of consideration. If we're gonna do this, do we need to consent them separately because we're gonna record what's a very private interaction and feed it into this tool? Um, you may be noticing a theme that I continue to just provide questions and that is, how we are. That is probably the most reliable way to, to ensure we're asking the right, uh, assessing for the right things. So that was one tool. Um, I will tell you that there are some legal things around psychotherapy specifically that actually, um, older rules that actually make this a challenging, um, a challenging thing to do. There's also another algorithm that's been published and used that, um, which will analyze um, either a recording or a transcript and then help you define and diagnose bipolar disorder. And the question we should be asking there is, well, before I would use this tool, what's the data set being used to train this recognition? Is it going to be sensitive and specific enough to my patient population? Um, if you're seeing these green boxes and you're thinking, oh my goodness, that would be so helpful. We're so, we're at such a, a deficit right now to provide reliable, timely, equitable behavioral health. This might all be true. These might be great. But unless we're asking the questions to the right of those green boxes, I think we're um, kind of uh, taking some risks with uh, the trust our patients have in us. Um, these are the references for those two tools. Um, there's also um, a tool that will actually deliver cognitive behavioral therapy. Like the actual tool is in the delivery. Um, it's, it's, it's like a chatbot feature and it's for um, treatment of pediatric obsessive compulsive disorder. So in terms of thinking about a deficit of care, is the tool reliably delivering an effective treatment? To make it even more complicated, would this child not get any treatment if we didn't provide it with this scalable tool? Um, maybe I should have put it at the top. This, this lecture is full of questions. And, uh, and I think if we're asking these kinds of questions as, as you know, trusted stewards of, of providing healthcare, this is the kind of thing we've got to ask and not just, um, not just sort of blindly accept that these are all positive things for our patients. And then finally, the, the fourth case um, that I have cited here is um, around the efficacy of therapy sessions. And um, this one is a concerning one. It was, this one is pulled uh, directly from um, a, a tool that I've been asked to assess. And um, what's interesting is um, it was tied to the idea that you, uh, your reimbursement might be tied to this. If you're not delivering effective therapy, that could impact um, the resources you're given to support it. And that one did raise, uh, I don't think I put a flag by this one, but that did raise a red flag because to our earlier question, does the patient have the right to decline this? Um, is it, how much is it their autonomy to choose how their care is delivered, especially for something that may or may not be um, proven as effective? So um, in these, oh, I do have a I do have some red flags here. So measurements of efficacy, the scale and speed of these tools is undeniable. Like the ability for a computer that does not get tired and is gonna execute the rules the same way every time is pretty, pretty intriguing to a lot of us that are pretty fatigued. Um, we, we, had, we had fatigue and burnout before COVID and now we certainly have it in our healthcare community. So um, speed and scale, very, very enticing. But are we measuring how effective this is? Are we um, are we getting too comfortable with these tools being able to be less biased than we as, as humans are? And then equity issues. There's, there's challenges in getting access to high quality behavioral health care. Right? We know that. 
Um, we know that in rural settings and, and other specific areas, depending on your resources, you are less likely to have these resources. So it might be compelling to say, oh, look, I can offer this. I can offer this um, at a lower cost and in a helpful way. But does it require broadband? Does it require a cell phone? Does it what else do these tools require? And are we ensuring that we're not creating division? Um, so, so not to like mire us in a morass of, um, of questions so that we never try any of these things. But in trying them, I think we just have to be incredibly disciplined about asking these good questions. Um, and then uh, as a pause here, I, I was saying earlier as we were uh, kind of talking about this discussion, I am a, a big sci-fi fan. I think many of you might be. And um, so uh, as you think through these examples and you start to think of uh, characters like, um, I don't know if any of you know who this is, but this is a uh, 2IB, which is a medical droid from Star Wars. And this particular droid was the one that um, helped heal Luke Skywalker after he was attacked in M M Empire Strikes Back both times. And as we think about these questions and you think about some of these things that used to be science fiction, but are becoming just very much reality, it, it's a uh, I actually think that line of, of what we look to in the scientific literature encompassing what we culturally accept just becomes more and more prominent. So, um, and again, uh, 2IB you could make the argument that this droid delivered consistent care um, in this fictional science uh, Star Wars setting. So, um, and uh, um, I guess extra points if anyone can tell us the treatment that they used um, while they were on the planet. I'm just kidding, so you don't have to. So um, just moving forward to some other use cases, you're like, well, maybe behavioral health's too personal or too unpredictable. What about something like dermatology? Because earlier I said that a computer can be trained to process, process tons and tons of data. It doesn't get tired. You can feed use cases through it endlessly and it can see more and, uh, and predict more patterns than um, as a human it would take me to do um, in my own time. So, Dermatology feels like a natural um, opportunity, and it is. There's actually a ton of work. Um, actually, dermatology and radiology both have a lot of health IT applications already in use. Um, Google announced that it's going to provide an AI tool for dermatology, and this announcement was from uh, um, uh, just earlier this year. But if you even read the press release, I'll go ahead and flag a couple red flags here. So. Google tracks what we search, right? They know they have this data. They know there's almost 10 billion searches related to these issues. So they are trying to meet a need. But then here's that risk again, that there's a global shortage of specialists to provide that traditional mechanism for assessment. So you start to have to ask the question, is it better to have nothing? Is it better to have, excuse me, an AI provided search engine? Um, and some people may say, you know what, I'm, I'm, if it's going to take me however long and I don't live near or I don't have the insurance or, or way to pay for a visit to the dermatologist, I might use this. But um, even within AI, that feels like it should be reproducible and very trustworthy. It can be fooled. Um, there's something called an adversarial attack um, that you can do uh, on AI and NLP. And what it does is it actually introduces things that are confounders into that algorithm. It kind of introduced tricky data or bad data. In this example, this is from a paper from 2019 it's in Science. It's a great paper. And it's one of the first ways I learned about this particular, I guess, weakness of AI. But if um, it's you're training a tool to try to recognize melanoma, right? That feels like a great application. And, and in a lot of ways it is. But here's a benign unnevis, again, a pediatrician, but not, not a dermatologist, but um, this is a picture of a benign nevus, and they model said it was uh, benign. It was relatively confident it was benign. There's some noise that can be introduced into this image. And if you look at it with your human eyes, most of us are not going to see any difference. But the computer did. The computer saw this noise and says, oh, wait, no, this is malignant. So again, how do you counter this? Um, the, the paper talks about how data scientists actually plan for this, and they try to kind of assault the models with with noise so that the model can learn to ignore those, the things that are noise. But from a consideration with, um, uh, in terms of all those other principles we think about, how do you determine what's noise and how do you not? The further you get from um, those assessments, the more, the more uh, vulnerable your tool is. So 
Um, so this is one in dermatology. Interestingly, I mean, I have this paper in the references. There was a lovely uh, Cochrane review of smartphone applications for dermato dermatologic um, uh, diagnosis. And the Cochrane review actually said that that could be some concerns because people may have a false sense of security based on the tool's ability to, to diagnose something that is benign or malignant. So um, I think most dermatologists, when you speak to them, they have a good, healthy skepticism of some of these tools and are wanting to test it and examine it and ask the good questions that we mentioned earlier in the talk. So um, finally, I'll go to one that is a risk assessment in healthcare. This one, um, again, has actually been probably present for a long time. Um, the parts of healthcare that a lot of us as clinicians don't love to be too involved in, billing and documentation, and what we tend to kind of put under bookkeeping and, and administrative task pieces is something most of us are willing to kind of hand off. We're like, oh, yes, please train a computer to figure out what level I should build this at, right? Um, that has been documented. And, and I think if you go and do a, you know, a straw poll just among your, your team in your clinic or your hospital, most people are not going to say, oh, I, I love billing. Please don't, <laughs> please don't take it away. Most of them are okay letting it go. But um, there are tools that um, we need to still examine as well. Um, this particular use case is a commercial risk assessment tool, very well established, used for over 200 million people. And um, it is proprietary, and it's not totally transparent how this tool is trained, but it is used across huge, large health systems. And the reason why is, um, large health insurers say, well, I've got this much resources. I need to figure out which patients are going to benefit the most. And so isn't it great? I've got this tool that can be very fair and accurate and we won't have, it'll be consistent and it'll look at all of these things. And they're trying to, so it's a very noble effort, right? This was used for a long time. And then um, a scientist, a data scientist decided to kind of examine it and see how the impact, what the impact of applying this this um, um, algorithm was. So a researcher took some data um, that was in a risk-based plan and compared it with things that actually weren't even included in the algorithm. Race was not included in the algorithm, but the researchers found that the algorithm was scoring um, Black people, Black patients that were less healthy with a similar risk score. And they said, well, that doesn't make sense. If, if a Black patient has a more severe chronic disease or more severe diseases together, shouldn't their risk score be higher? Because what happens is if you have an equivocal risk score, you're going to select um, for the resources at a different level. And that's what happened. Therefore, the algorithm was way less likely to refer a Black patient than a white patient for these resources. Um, and they dug, they really had to dig into why that was because they were, the, the race was not in the algorithm. But what happened was that it reflected the fact that Black patients were less likely to access, and so they were spending less on healthcare. And so spending was predicting the algorithm. Um, so the red flag here is, here's a big, big high impact tool applied to millions of patients, but we don't exactly know what's under the hood. That's kind of an oversimplification. But um, these researchers did the hard work, and, and then you guys might remember this. Um, it was from fall of 2019, so I don't, I don't know if it, um, <laughs> it probably wasn't in the headlines as much as it would have been otherwise, but millions of people in terms of the resources because of the algorithm um, that was here. Now, I'm going to come back to this paper. It's Dr. Obermeyer and his team because it actually has a hopeful outcome. But um, just another example here, in the documentation tools, you can actually have um, things change very mildly and definitely change the way that the patient experiences care. This particular example is from that same case that we shared earlier with the recognition of the nevus, only this time it's recognition of what I said in the chart. So text substitutions can get change to, to uh, change your opioid risk score, or even approve or deny whether your insurance pays for something. So, so if, you've, if you've listened to these use cases and, and you're, you're feeling maybe a little, sometimes I, at least I do when I'm reviewing this literature, I feel kind of overwhelmed about like, what, what do I do next? How do I do, how do I proceed in a way that is um, the right way to, to weigh these, um, these technologies? And I think the key right now is in balance, balancing this. So um, 
you remember that hype curve I showed you earlier with all these technologies rising up to these inflated expectations. Right now, there's a lot of pressure to be, to be innovative, to do something new, and that's great. Um, but the balance is if we do all innovation and no kind of regulatory or gut check, we may start to adopt things that have bad processes baked in. And unless we um, kind of exercise that discipline in healthcare to question and select and always be kind of disciplined in, in the outputs of these tools, we're going to get into a kind of a bad position pretty quickly. So the balance of innovation and, and discipline of controlling is one that we um, would strive for. And I would ask this audience to be part of that discipline as well. I would actually say that it would be better if you weren't the um, techni wildly technically savvy when you raise these kinds of questions. So other folks have offered some select some ideas as well. This is a, a paper from Jamia as well about how you might um, think about um, clinical research. How do we look at new drugs and treatments before we put them into kind of standard care? And could you use that for an AI or a software uh, machine learning tool? So you can. You can do things like assess the data you use to train the tool. There's actually some open, some, some tools that are designed to tell you whether your data source is biased or not. Um, there are a set of skills, right? We still need to kind of keep, we need to keep humans in the mix here because um, the first example I gave with pediatric sepsis a human can look at the performance of that tool and the performance without the tool and understand both of those models. So it's important that we keep that expertise in there because it's also important for the clinical expertise to predict the impact of the outcomes. Um, and then finally, some best practices. Um, this is recommended by the authors of this paper, but there, there's others that have been, come on board with this that um, probably if you're the developer, you shouldn't evaluate your own. There's a reason we, as, as clinical uh, healthcare workers, we, we commit to things like peer review of our work. And there's a lot of argument that um, programmers and data scientists should have that same level of commitment. Um, and also we should really be more creative in how we evaluate these tools. Um, there's no reason why the expertise in academia, public health, private practice and equity couldn't pool that knowledge. Um, and in an ideal state, wouldn't it be great if someone who had nothing to gain or lose could really do that review? That would be an ideal state um, to assess the tools. But then that, that leaves the other question we said earlier about like, how do I talk to my patients about this? How, how is, what's, what's the right way to describe the risks and benefits of a care decision I made with the assistance of, of AI? Um, um, same from that dermatology example, um, uh, this is actually a, from a group from Australia um, that studies dermatology, which has a pretty um, large amount given kind of the environment there. And one thing that they suggested was this here in their table one about skin cancer diagnoses in AI. Can you say to your patient, like, we might, this tool might miss a malignancy? Um, can you say that your data, we, we don't consent patients always to say, well, someone could hack your data. It happens all the time now. Medical data is, is more valuable in the black market than credit scores and credit card information. So those are some risks. Um, how we talk about the benefits and the limitation. Is this something we need to start weaving into our consent um, the same way that when we consent for a procedure? I would argue it is. I think it's a good skill to start to do this. Now, this particular example is really specific to AI software and skin cancer. So how would you do this in your particular area? And challenge you to kind of think through that. Um, and then there's these other kind of more, less tactical, maybe kind of more strategic or guiding principles. Um, the algorithm and data community is not a diverse one. There's not a lot of diversity in that group. So you're seeing what we're seeing, at least in healthcare, is a lot of movement to say we've got to build more points of view because you will, as a programmer, build your own biases into whatever you make. And so one way to counter that is to ensure that we have a variety of opinions represented in that expertise. I really love this word, um, data empathy. It sounds so funny. It sounds like something from a Star Wars droid again, but data empathy means understanding the deep context of what the data you um, are using. Where does it come from? What was the intentions when we collected it? Is it really right that we use it to train this tool when maybe it was collected to do something else? And then, um, I really like this statement, which, which is from the, the Lancet uh, Digital Health earlier this year. 
because it kind of gets to that idea of the oath we take as, as physicians and, and many of us as healthcare providers take, which is that a data scientist has that same obligation and responsibility to tackle um, this particular one was around different forms of racism and bias in their sector. I think that's a, a must do. And I'm, I'm really honestly quite encouraged for all of the scary things I presented in those use cases. I've met a ton of data scientists and vendors really committed to looking at their tools in a way that continues to address this. And so um, there's great hopefulness in this. And I told you I'd come back to that use case that was around um, resources, right? The one that impacted millions of patients. This is the primary author on the publication that pointed out the racial bias of that algorithm. And what was really encouraging is that they didn't just publish it as kind of a gotcha, but they actually worked pro bono with the company on the algorithm to address those racial biases and try to correct for it. Now, it's still a private algorithm, so I don't actually have a publicly available <laughs> output of what changes they made, but I felt it was very encouraging. And it also prompted things like groups like um, the AHRQ asking for um, information about what clinical algorithms might induce bias and how do we look at these together as a group. Um, that same group published something called the Algorithm and Bias Playbook. So something like this is freely available um, that we apply to sort of these tools is just an incredibly critical part of ensuring that we use AI in a way that is um, staying true to, to what we all commit to do as, as physicians, in my case, and other healthcare providers. So in conclusion, hopefully this leaves you with a bit of hope in your heart about these tools, because I am quite hopeful. Um, I will close on this idea that um, it's a very hard time for all of us that work in clinical healthcare. It is, uh, we stopped saying unprecedented six months ago, um, and we are tired. We are all very, very tired. And when we look at these technologies, um, I would just encourage us not to let that fatigue and that frustration make us take more risk than we need to. Because when you think about all of us as human getting tired, um, robots don't get tired. Um, computers don't get tired. This is from Big Hero 6, the idea that this little, this robot would be your healthcare provider. But it's, this is actually from a real instance in Japan of a robot caregiver. The desire to lean into some of these solutions is so strong right now because there is so much fatigue and they can be great. But I'm, I'm hopeful that what I shared today kind of put some ideas in your head about how you can bring those, uh, ask the good questions so that we're not bringing things into our healthcare that um, worsen inequity or, or take away our patients' abilities to make informed decisions and, um, and really help us choose the right solutions to help, help us move forward. Um, that concludes my prepared content. I'm happy to take any questions and I thank you for your time. Dr. Weber, thank you so much. We do have some questions that are coming in. Um, so, uh, and I'm going to encourage anybody to go ahead and put that in the Q and A um, instead of. Uh, and it, that's this is the easiest way for us. We are not able to um, unmute people. So, please, if you have a question, there's a little Q and A box down there. So, please do that. So, I want to um, ask you the first question that came in related back to um, when you were talking about um, artificial intelligence and the psychotherapy. So one of the questions um, asked is, I have researched the common factors in effective psychotherapy, and one of the primary factors named for effective treatment was the relationship between the therapist and the patient and client. How does AI address that? Wonderful question. Thank you so much, Emily. Love your, love your name, too. Um, so it depends what tool you're looking at. The four tools that I cited, um, I think two of them actually put into their model things like how often have you been to the clinic? How long, how many visits have you had? What were the duration of your other visits? And tried to do that, tried to like predict that connection. Um, to be honest, I actually feel like that's a very interesting construct to try to um, put into objective measures what feels like an inherently subjective thing, like a connection and a comfort. So much goes into that that's not in a discrete data tool. Um, so I think they've made attempts to, to measure that um, within algorithms. But um, if I had my little icon, I'd put a little red flag by that because um, I think probably the primary source of information, how comfortable a patient feels and truly how connected they are to, to who's providing the therapy is something that's, I would give that one a red flag because even though some try to account for it, I don't know that it's 
I don't think they've proven it's very reliable. So great question. Um, hopefully that, again, I feel, I feel I should have put that at the top. It, this is a lot of good, asking the good questions helps us get there. And I think in that scenario, I don't wanna come off as like, no one ever used these tools. I think the biggest mistake would just be kind of giving that over and only letting um, an artificial intelligence tool predict this. It, it can be one facet of it. Maybe that's a better way to think about it. I don't want to. Um, I don't want to be all gloom and doom because there's a lot of promise in these tools, but it has to be balanced. So, great question. And then here's the next one. Um, is there any new innovations that have caught your eye that have a hope of being used soon? Yes, um, and thank you, that's a great question. Um, I think that the ones that are used soon, and I actually think probably some of the doctors who were involved with this, um, I mentioned the pediatric sepsis tool, the ones that are closest to kind of that, that human observer element are ones that we're using right away. So sepsis is a great one, um, <laughs> excuse me, um, a great tool. We also have one in kind of, uh, we're actually using one around um, improving our assessments around uh, physical child abuse because um, our clinical teams were hungry for this because they felt this was really inconsistently done. And they said, I would love some reminders if these criteria are met. But that's another one where logic and the rules are written by humans and closely supervised. We didn't turn on anything in, and use any tools that said, now please make your own assumptions predictive algorithm. We oversee all of that. So the ones that are most promised or most likely to kind of make their way into healthcare now are the ones on that further end. Um, now there's other, other tools that are, um, I think kind of more invisible uh, or you don't necessarily think about. And I would maybe put those in the realm of if we are using um, translator services and chatbots as well, that's another AI tool that's pretty immediate in our, in our environment. Um, we, a lot of people took advantage of the COVID chatbot tool, especially last spring when it felt like the, what we were learning about COVID changed so quickly, including symptoms. The Microsoft Azure, um, Azure, Azure, Azure platform, that chatbot was made available to all healthcare organizations. So you could actually embed it on your public facing website and have a symptom checker that was aligned to the one the CDC was using. So wonderful question. There's a lot that's in there. I kind of shared the, the scary ones that we haven't quite done yet, mostly because of the concerns we had, but there's a lot already there, so wonderful. It's a great question related to IU Health. What types of checks and balances does IU Health have to ensure that we are using data empathy? And I would ensure, I, I'm assuming you are one of the checks or one of the balances. But what <laughs> yes, thank you so much. That is a wonderful question. Thank you um, for that. Uh, and, and I would say that probably right now there are checks and balances that are, are human people. And I am one of them, but I would argue our clinical experts are the same. There's a lot of times, I did this yesterday, I reached out to a physician where we had a proposal to use a tool and it was in their area of expertise. And I needed their, I needed their gut check as well as their clinical expertise to say, have you heard of this? This is where it's been published. Does this seem um, comparable to what this kind of the accepted best practices are for our patients? Um, the other one I would say is that we actually have some, um, even something like our security tools and our, um, those are actually a way to check for data empathy as well, so that we know that, um, for example, if we're using billing data, we need our tools to tell us where it's coming from and how up to date is it and has it been amended, all of these other things so that we know how much to, how, how much to trust it, but also how much to kind of reel back and not put into the tool. We'll let the tool make the decision on its own. Um, I will also say that I don't know that anyone has this perfected as a data empathy model for um, how we consider AI and machine learning driven tools. But I'm, I think the huge benefit at IU Health is, is that we've got the School of Medicine's expertise. We've got um, groups, we've got all the resources of groups like the Vegan Street Institute also to kind of help us answer those hard questions. So um, hopefully that helps. And hopefully that, hopefully that reassures that we're, we are asking these questions. Great. So um, about you, as your building example showed, it seems a large potential source of bias is automating already biased processes over which there is no new oversight. How can this be detected and addressed? 
These are such great questions. Thank you guys so much. Um, so I think that there's the paper um, that we shared about the racially biased algorithm that was being used to assign home care resources. Um, that is that was grown out of a scientist's knowledge and coupled with a sense and a, and a charge to be looking for things like systemic inequity. Um, you kind of have to marry the two, right? And you almost have to sort of weave together um, this being a practice in your, in your almost in your everyday life. I, I always use the, the analogy that the way you think about patient safety um, clinically is how we probably need to start thinking about equity as well. And um, excuse me, I think um, that how we detect it is something that is um, kind of hot on the on all of the vendors' minds, some more than others. If you go and look at, say, an EHR company or a billing company or that, that tool that we mentioned, a lot of them will describe what they're doing to detect, detect bias. And um, sometimes, it's, sometimes it's external review, like, with that, like the uh, concluding paper had mentioned. If you, have an, if you commit to having an external review of your tool, that's one way that you do it. You almost have to have someone totally disconnected, but with the same expertise, um, who doesn't really stand to gain or lose anything. Because if, if I'm an external reviewer and I say to you, you know what, your tool's gonna select for these biases, um, and that means you can't deploy it. That means you can't go out and sell it. I need to be free from those constraints internally to be able to give that kind of advice. So I do keep coming back to external review. If you can use some of the things we do to already in medicine to kind of safeguard against this. Great question. I think we have time for one more, but I also want to put in that in the Q&A, um, we've had someone put in some information about um, I use AI week, and that's tomorrow. There are some lectures that are happening, and that it's actually called Regan Streif Day. So if you'd like to check those out, the links are in there. Um, and some really good things around um, a legal and ethics panel and a um, Another panel that is so long of a word, I'm not even going to try to pronounce it. So just try to look up those um, great resources there. Thank you so much for, for mentioning those. So I want to um, we have this question. What, uh, what area do patients want AI? So let's focus on what the patients are wanting. It seems like most are reluctant to adopt this new model of care. What are you seeing? That's a great question. And thank you so much, Anita, for calling that out. This is perfectly timed with AI Week. So Although some of us feel like every week is AI week, given the amount of interest. And you are so right, like our patients, um, it, I do think I shared those, those papers about kind of their reluctance to give over healthcare to AI. And I think it depends, it, it is quite personal. I think when patients feel their individuality and their personal values and choices are being submerged, they are less likely to engage and so, um, or, or to want it. So if something, and I'll give you a really extreme example, if I am being diagnosed with cancer and I want to figure out what my care plan, what is my plan for tackling this cancer? I do not, I don't really want an AI to spit out a plan at me. I want my, I want to talk to my oncologist. I want a human discussion about what is this really going to be like. Now the oncology team may need those tools to do things like predict pharmacogenetics and the most effective drugs, but they want, um, they want a uh, it to be delivered by a human. We don't want the tool to do that. No one would want that, right? But you contrast that with where we are right now. I think a lot of us are very comfortable letting an AI algorithm or a chat bot help find the nearest site so that you can go get a COVID test or a vaccine. And I feel like it's very much dependent on all of those facets. So it's not really locked in. I think it's very amenable to individual um, values, preference, and then also the environment you find yourself. I hope I hope that's helpful. I think I think there's a lot of promise here, and I don't want anyone to walk away being like, "Oh, it's all bad. It's all evil," because it really isn't. It it really though it needs people like this community and and community at, at Regan Street and data scientists and researchers to really you know make the right choices and invest and use the um, tools that are going to bring the greatest benefit. So. Um, no simple answers here, but I know this is the right place to bring hard questions. I, everyone, I think ethicists are super good at embracing hard questions. So I'm grateful for the chance to, to talk with this community today. Well, 
what was really great. Thank you. We have more questions in there, and I'm so sorry we did not get to all of them, but we will email those to you, Dr. Weber, if you wouldn't mind um, finding ways to, to sort of uh, to answer. And um, we thank you. Thank you for helping us think this through, for asking those questions, and for encouraging us to ask this quest those questions today. We really appreciate this. So thank you all, and we'll see you next month. Bye-bye.